My talk is called uh, Function Extraction, map Mapping Programs into Mathematical Equations. Uh, so the history of this is that we have been uh, using Mathematica to extract the function of C-like programs uh, since 2007. And then after a while, uh, I published everything I had to say about this and I, I was done. Uh, but my co-author Richard Linger contacted me back and said that actually that work um, lends itself to a product that we can uh, use uh, at scale. So then we resumed uh, work on this uh, about two years ago and I'm here by reporting on what we are at. Um, so I will talk about what does it mean to extract the function of the program? How do we do this uh, by uh, transforming source code into a program function. Of course, the bottleneck of this is how we compute the function of loops. And that has been an obstacle for a long time. And um, uh, so we will discuss that. Then we will discuss how that falls into the overall goal of computing program functions. And then if you have time, I will talk briefly about some um, scalable um, ways to do that. So computing the function of a program is really a decades old dream. Uh, people usually refer to this as symbolic execution, as a way to test programs for a wide range of inputs. But in the absence of the ability to capture the function of loops, what people have done in the past is they compute the function of one execution path at a time. But of course, all programs have an infinity of execution paths. So this is um, important uh, to be able to do this for, um, uh, to be able to draw precise automatically generated uh, documentation uh, because it supports your reuse and also because it um, exposes malicious uh, functionality. So what makes malicious code uh, dangerous is not that the program is incorrect. It's not that the program fails to do what it's supposed to do. Rather, it's because the program is doing something it's not supposed to do. So all the verification you can think of will never catch the fact that the program is doing something in, in hiding. So we proceed in three steps. First of all, we go from source code, in this case, Java, but it could be any, any other C-like language, into an abstract syntax tree using uh, common uh, parsers. Then we transform the abstract syntax tree into a Mathematica equation that involves the input and the output of the program, or if you wish, the initial state and the final state. And then from then on, it's up to Mathematica. Whatever Mathematica can do, we can do. So the third step is to go from the Mathematica equation to the program function. In effect, what we generate is an equation of the form EQ of initial state, final state. And then we rely on Mathematica, if it can, change that into a functional form, which says SP equal F of S. And the focus of our work, obviously, is the second step. So as an example, I take a very uh, simple program. That's the abstract syntax tree for it. And the Mathematica equation uh, for it is what you see on the left. And then uh, when we ask Mathematica to generate a function, we get the description on the right. Uh, sorry. I take a slightly more complex program this time, but this time I have uh, loops in it. So there is a branching logic. There is a while loop there, a while loop here, a while loop here with, with a for loop inside it. And my guess is if I, if I ask 100 programmers with 20 years experience minimum to tell me what this program is doing, uh, I would be lucky if one of them could. Alternatively, we can push a button and uh, ask the program, the system to tell us. 
And yeah, so this is the abstraction tax three, doesn't matter. This is the function that the program is computing. And the first, the first comment uh, or the first observation to make is the original code had three branches. So the case where I greater than J, the case where J greater than I, else the case where I is equal to J. And you wonder why is it that the function has two branches? The function has only a branch for I less than J and the branch for I equal J. So then I go back to the code and I say, what happened with the first branch? And if you look at the first branch, you see that they have a loop here where I is increased by K, then I decrement K, then I decrease I by K, I subtract I from K. Meaning that at each iteration, I increase I by one. And you notice that the loop exits if I is equal to J. So you are increasing I by one every time, waiting for I to be equal to J. But wait a minute, but I enter this loop, I enter this branch only if I is greater than J. Meaning whenever I enter this branch, I never terminate. Okay, when you try to compute the function of this program, it will, you will find that the case of I greater than J is not there. It only terminates if I is less than or equal to J. The other thing you find is here it says I equal J, but J greater or equal to zero. Meaning if J is not greater than or equal to zero, I am not going to terminate. And if you go back, you see why. Because here, I am increasing, uh, yeah, here. I am increasing T by one, and I am waiting for T to be equal to I. But you notice that T has been set to I minus J, and I am entering this, this branch only if I is equal to J, meaning when I enter, T is equal to zero, and I am increasing T by one each time, waiting for it to be equal to I. The only way this will work is if I is greater than zero, and because I is equal to J, Mathematica said j greater than equal to zero, which is the same thing. Okay, so this here is telling me under what condition this program will terminate, and it is telling me each time what happens when the program terminates. So in this case, it's computing some combination of Fibonacci functions. In the other case, it's computing some uh, arithmetic expression. So what I uh, wanted to show is uh, this here is the mathematical equation that is generated for that small program. Um, so the, the nesting in the equation is a reflection of the nesting in the, um, in the source code. And the parts that I uh, highlight, I will come back to them in a minute. These are the parts that stem from uh, trying to evaluate the uh, the y, the loops. Okay, so how do we compute loop functions? Um, by introducing the concept of an invariant relation. And an invariant relation is uh, uh, when you when you look at the uh, guarded loop body which are represented by T intersect B, where B is the function of the loop body and T is the relation that takes the pre-restriction of that. So that's the representation of T as a relation. Then, um, so the an invariant relation is, is a reflexive transitive superset of the guarded, uh, of the function of the guarded loop body. Meaning it, in fact, it's a relation that holds between any two sets S and S prime that are separated by an arbitrary number of iterations, including zero. And why is that important? Simply because of this proposition here, which says, if R is an invariant relation of W, then the function of W is a subset of R intersection. So T inverse complement, meaning R intersection, uh, condition T prime on the final state, okay? So to compute the function of the loop, we have to find invariant relations, take their intersection, then take the post restriction to not T, and that should uh, deliver the function of the loop. What are invariant relations? I know, every, you know, most everybody is uh, familiar with invariant assertions and loop invariant, etc. 
we find that uh, invariant relations are a lot more useful and a lot more uh, powerful as a concept. So if I take this very simple program and I make it simple on purpose to be able to illustrate, these are three invariant relations. N prime equal N, obviously K less than K prime, but most importantly, F divided by K minus one factorial equal F prime divided by K prime minus one factorial, okay? These relations hold between any two states that are separated by any number of iterations. So, um, yeah, there is a, dis a discussion about the relation with loop invariance. I will come back to it if there is an interest. But if I take the intersection of these three invariant relations and um, I consider this precondition, which is f equal one, k equal one, n equal and zero, then I get this invariant relation which is n equal and zero, k greater than or equal to one, and f equal k minus one factorial. So that's the loop invariant, but actually the invariant relation is saying a lot more than that. So how do we generate invariant relations? This is really the key idea is, first of all, we have a, an invariant relation that we get for free, which is this relation. And this relation says either s prime is equal to s, that's the case when no, then when the loop does not iterate at all, or the initial state satisfies T and the final state is in the range of the guarded loop body. And for all other relations, we proceed by uh, pattern matching. And pattern matching is a situation where we look at the function of the loop body and we see if we recognize some patterns in the various clauses, and depending on what we recognize, we generate corresponding invariant relation. So for example, if I have X prime equal X plus A in the loop body, and I know that A is non-negative, or actually A is positive, then what do we know? We know that X is less than X prime, and that X mod A is, less, is equal to X prime mod A, okay? If I know that X prime is X plus A and Y prime is Y plus B, what do I know? I know that A, AY minus BX equal AY prime minus BX prime. If I notice in the loop body X prime equal F of X and I prime equal I minus one, what do I know to be invariant relation is FI of X equal FI prime of X prime. Etc. So I recognize patterns in the code and I generate the corresponding invariant relation. I take the intersection of all this, take the post restriction to T of S prime, and then submit all that to Mathematica to get the function of the loop. So then how do we integrate this into computing the function of a program? If I have an assignment statement, x equally of s, uh, equally of s, we generate the following mathematical equation that says, first of all, E can be evaluated at state s. So for example, if E is log, then s has to be positive. If E is a square root, s has to be non-negative, et cetera. Then xp is equal to E of s and all the other variables are preserved. That's the equation we generate for an, an assignment statement. If I have a sequence statement, then I take the first part of the sequence, I apply A to M to it, whatever that return, it will return an equation in SSP. Then I apply a function we call SP to SPP, which replaces every instance of SP by SPP. Then I apply A to M to the second term and replace every instance of S by SPP. Then I quantify SPP by the existential quantifier. And what do I get? I now get an equation between S and SP. So I start with an equation between S and SP first element. 
an equation between S and SP second element, and I get an equation between SSP of the overall sequence. Okay, that's why you see nested uh, uh, calls within the uh, mathematical code. It's because the longer the sequence, the deeper the nesting will be. Conditional statements, it's all, you know, this is very simple. If you have if T A else B, then we generate the equation T S and A to M A or not T S and A to M B. And if you have an if else, if T L, uh, if I'm sorry, if T A, then we generate the equation T of S and A to M A or not T of S and S P equal S. For the while loop, if I have a while loop, then I do, I generate the elementary invariant relation. You remember the invariant relation that says either the loop does not execute at all, or if the loop executes at least once, then S satisfies T and S prime is in the range of T and B. So that, that's the one I get. Then we call in R. And in R is the relation that stems from the pattern matching uh, algorithm that we uh, described earlier with the table of recognizers. And in R, we give it the condition of the loop and A to M of the loop body, whatever A to M returns for the loop body. And negation of condition T of SP. Okay. So the function of the loop body is obtained by taking the elementary invariant relation, adding all the invariant relations that stem from the recognizers, adding condition not T, and having Mathematica solve in final state as a function of the initial state. For loop, if I have a for loop that starts from I equal one um, until uh, H, I plus plus, then, we introduce the variable i because remember i, when you, when you write the Java code or C++ code or what have you, the variable of the, the variable that you use for the for loop is not part of the state, okay? So we quantify it existentially, the initial value and the final value. And we add to that i equal one, ip equal h plus one, and inv r, so in R, I must give it the condition of the loop and the loop body. So in R, the condition of the loop is I less than H and the loop body is A to M of the loop body to which I add the condition IP equal I plus one. Um, so approach, as you notice, is critically dependent on having uh, recognizers that are very general okay we don't want these recognizers to be to be uh, to match only one instance uh, you know to, to we want these recognizers to be as broadly applicable as possible and we have an example of fairly um, generic recognizers which are recognize that are applicable to affine transformations. So imagine that you have a while loop that performs transformations of the, of the form X prime equal A X plus B, where A is different from zero and one. Then we know that this here is an invariant relation for the, for the loop. And this says fractional part of log base A X prime plus B divided by A minus one equal fractional part of the same thing for, for X. Also, if we have two of these, if we have two affine transformation, then this here is the invariant relation. And if instead of two, I have, let's say 10, then I can apply R0, the previous one, to one of them, and I can apply R1 nine times to the remaining uh, pairs composed of the pivot and each one of the nine others. 
Meaning what? Meaning if I have 10 affine transformations like that, I can actually generate nine equations with R1 plus an equation with R0 plus add the condition that T not T is valid for S prime. And that gives me all the necessary equations to be able to determine the function of the loop. So here is an example of what it means. Imagine that here I do X prime equal five X plus three. So I have a sequence. Here I do Y prime equal three Y plus five. I have the same sequence. According to R zero, the fractional part of all these numbers is constant. The fractional part of all these numbers is constant as you see. And um, and then the difference between two, the, the two, this is the, um, the R1. It, the difference is um, constant through the, through the whole iteration. And using information like that will give us the uh, function of the loop. So we have a three-step algorithm for computing the function of a program uh, to perform the symbolic execution of the program, which is a function from initial state to final state. Um, we are able to capture the function of iterative statements, such as while loops, um, uh, for loops, but uh, also other uh, iterative statements, such, such as um, repeats and the like. We really owe most of the feasibility of this uh, process to the fact that we are uh, using two uh, successful technologies, namely the compiler generation technology, which maps a source code into an abstract syntax tree, and the uh, Mathematica, which then takes the equation that we generate and produce uh, the function of the problem. For the sake of comparison with existing technology, we take, for example, this program and we apply the, uh, the um, invariant relation that I just showed a minute ago for, for uh, affine transformations. And when we uh, generate the loop invariant, we find this expression. And for comparison, we look at uh, a tool developed at MIT several years ago called DICON. And this is what we get with DICON. Uh, then we look at another tool developed at Stanford and uh, this is what we get for the same program. And uh, by comparison, um, we argue that what we are providing is a lot more precise and um, gives more information. There is another tool we have been trying to run but we couldn't uh, develop at Princeton called SRK uh, and we are anxious to find what SRK will deliver. So a possible critique of this approach is that we can only handle loops for which we have recognizers. But we argue that there is no way to analyze programs without producing programming knowledge without having codifying somewhere programming knowledge and domain knowledge. And recognizers are the way in which we codify this knowledge. So that the need for codifying this knowledge is a feature of the problem rather than a feature of the solution. Uh, finally, as far as uh, our prospects, uh, clearly we need to define uh, adequate uh, database of recognizers that are uh, fairly generic. We need to also um, develop an algorithm for semantic matching. And um, it's possible that if I take a 500 line program and give you the function, you will probably find that the function is even more obnoxious than the program and it's probably harder to, to analyze. So then we produce functions we call assume, capture, verify, establish, which enable the user to query the source code in uh, greater detail. And I conclude here and I thank you for your attention.